doing a little reloading uh, with uh, the 257 this evening and I can't show you all the process but I wanted to show you the value of old load manuals um, so I have most of the Hornady, most of the Sierra, some of the Nosler, um, quite a few Lyman, uh, any sort of special edition uh, load manual like Loader's Digest or anything going back to about 1964. But in the Spear manuals, you know, I have, this is their number one. This was made in 1954, or let me see, I misquote it. Yeah, it says 54, and then it, but then they printed it like five times. Um, I have one. I do not have two, three, or four. Still looking for those. Um, but I, did ha I do have five. And it's kind of interesting because if you go clear back to number one, they don't list the 257 Weatherby in here, but they do list some other 25s that I've seen them in used gun racks and things like that, but I've never owned one. Uh, I'm going to try to find it real quick here. But they've got stuff like... Um, but they start... Their 25 section in, the, in number one starts with uh, the 253,000 Savage. We all have probably seen those. Their next one is the 257 Roberts, which I think we've pretty much all heard of that. But then they go to the 25 Super, spelled like soup -er, Um which may have evolved into something else because in number five, they've got like a 25 Improved or something like that, uh, which is not the 257 uh, Roberts Improved. It's some other cartridge. Uh, and then they go to the 25 meter or niter, however you'd pronounce that. And then it goes into the Japanese Arasaka. So the 257 was invented early enough. It could have been in this book, but apparently Vernon Spear did not have it in there. But by the time you get to number five, and it might be, you know, like I say, I don't have two, three, or four, so I can't verify what year it popped up. But I know by the, you see, we're pretty decrepit. But <clears throat> I look around in bookstores and eBay and whatnot. So by number five, it's here. And I know that a lot of people say, well, is there any loads ever listed for forty-eight ninety-five? Well, there's some right here in this book. So maybe in two, three, and four, there might be some, but there's some right here listed. Um, that's why I have these, because you could start moving along. So, these brass right here started out the other day when the guy was shooting them and just going to discard them. These were 7 millimeter mag, right? So I came home, and he didn't want them, so I brought them home and kneeled them, sized them down. They're about 5,000 short. They will grow, but I don't want to put a... Um, nuclear hot full load in it and that's where people i see on the internet people are like hey what about fire forming and you know a lot of people say oh, i just use kind of a half load or i use this or that you know but then sometimes you end up with case ruptures and stuff like that when you're trying to fully finish it out um unfortunately some of these powders like trail boss got discontinued this is the last little bit of it i've got um, and you can make any sort of low-powered load with this. Uh, Hotchkin still has information on their website. You can go there and do the little formula for any cartridge case and come up with something. However, in thicker-walled cases like Magnums, this for fire forming, this works pretty good in your standard cartridge cases. But in the early days of 458 SOCOM, uh, when brass was hard to get, I would use 300 wind mag brass, uh, and I would lathe the rim off and then anneal almost the full case and I was trying to use trail boss to fire form that stuff but it just didn't want to generate the pressure to do it so I started having to use some uh, other powders that are out there and, and you can find stories 
in other old load manuals about different types of pistol powders and 10% this or you know 60% that uh, bullseye pistol powder in 10% so you'd fill up your case measure how much it held you know dump it in a scale and then take 10% of that and that would be your starting 10% load with that kind of powder don't follow me in what I'm saying there I'm just saying that you can read stories about this in old reloading manuals anyway uh, so another powder that got discontinued is I happen to have three pounds of this left. That's it. That should be a lifetime supply because I only use it for fire forming. Um, starting in, I think, number five. So, again, I don't have two, three, or four, so I can't tell you for sure. But they've got the Weatherby in here, right? Do they list it in here? No, they I don't think they did. Hang on. Would it be Magnum? There's an Ackley Magnum too. Yeah, I don't I don't see that powder listed. But um, I think in spear number nine or eight which I didn't bring down here with me, but I did bring, I did bring spear number 10, which uh, this book came out. And I'm showing some of these ones that might be easier for people to find at used bookstores. This is a 79, 1979. But if we go back to the 257 weather beam. Right, come on, where are you? 264. There it is. You'll see that they have 4759 listed in here, and that's actually RED period load, so it's reduced load. And um, basically, these are low pressure, lower pressure, and they're really good for fire forming. So I used 120 grain uh, boat tail bullets. Now I didn't go up very high. I used uh, more than the minimum, but less than the maximum. Um, and since the rifle's fairly new, I'm not gonna fire form these in it yet. I wanna get the barrel broken in, but as soon as it's, I feel it's broken in, then I'll run these and that will cause them to get to their uh, shape. Then what I wanted to do is also show that that data hangs around for a while. So it started sometime in the probably the early 70s or late 60s, and it stayed in, Was it, it's in number 12, which is a, a 1994, and it's in number 13, which is a, uh, they printed it in 98, and the second printing was 1999, so it was in that book, but then by the time they got to 2007, which is book 14, they dropped it out, and that was around the time this powder uh, in the mid uh, 2000s there or so about was uh, getting discontinued along with uh, Trail Boss. So for whatever reason Spear dropped it out of their manual. But if you're looking for fire forming reduced load data and you can find some of this powder that is available. However since this powder is no longer available if you look on Hodgkin's website and you don't, you can't get Trail Boss and you don't want to try to mess with 48 uh, enough, they list loads for all sorts of Weatherby and all sorts of 25, all sorts of rounds, cartridges, they list 4895 for, except for the 257. And then, of course, they have a warning that, hey, if we don't have it for a particular cartridge, don't try to make up your own load for it. But then they do offer a phone number to call, so maybe they give out the information. I don't know. But, so, unless you actually have load data from an old book, uh, apparently, and, and you'd have to be using Spear Bullets, because it's Spear's the one that published it, um, you're not going to have that load data. And then, like I say, these two powders are not, you know, Trail Boss and this are, you know, good luck finding it if you can. You can get it. But, 
they do have load data listed for this. And the reason I have some of these, these don't meter well, this doesn't meter well, they're large crunchy powders. I do a lot of lead bullet casting and I have lead bullets that I shoot in some old military firearms and stuff. And so since most loads are not with lead bullets, aren't using the full capacity, filling that up with either a filler like Prima Wheat or Dacron is what I like to use. Um, but somehow keeping the reduced powder against the primer. Uh, and so these crunchy powders are what that's for. Well, I notice they have low data for 257 using this. They're not super high speed. Uh, and the highest load generates like 54,000 PSI, but the low load of this ge generates like 42,000 PSI. So that's significantly less. And so this might be what people need to look for to do modern uh, fire forming, if they're into that. I mean, just something I'm trying because, you know, if you've ever tried to get Weatherby brass, I have some, but... It's not cheap. So anyway, I just thought I'd talk about that a little bit and where you can find some information. Um, so hopefully that helps someone out and they can look around. And I, my own little thing I do, you know, besides all this, I mark these. I mean, I can see it says seven uh, millimeter magnum, but I mark it so I know when I go to the range what this is. It doesn't get mixed in with anything. And these are eventual to be fire formed. And like I say, uh, I also case checked every single one of them. I have a, a nice, uh, hang on a second, one of these uh, Wilson gauges. They make them in uh, Cashmere, Washington. Uh, interesting thing, it's, it's more affordable. Instead of me driving to Eastern Washington to go get these, it's more affordable for me to order them off the internet from like graphs and have them mailed to me. So anyway, this is an adjustable case gauge. So I used a factory piece of ammo, stuck it in here, adjusted it, and then I verified that all these fit and they did. So these will chamber and fire. The actual purpose of an adjustable case gauge though is that um, after I've once fired everything, I can adjust this gauge to that and then use it for setting up my uh, dies when I'm just necking. And because uh, even with a necking die, you need to set it correctly. But uh, I'm going to start uh, after I've once fired, I'm not going to headspace off of this rim. I'm going to be headspacing off the shoulder up here. So that's what this gauge helps with once I get to that point. Anyway, uh, I think that's enough for now, so thanks for watching.